admiration for this man. And uh, he, he was one of the good ones. You know, he was one of the good black men of the community. And, uh, and it, it, it hurts my heart that he would die so suddenly. He died in a car crash. And uh, he was one of the first black males I met when I, uh, when I was a baby. And, uh, you know, to see him kind of move on to heaven is, uh, you know, it's kind of it's rough. But, it, you know, it's a reminder that life is short. And whatever time you got on this earth, you need to use it right because you don't know when. Uh, when you're going to get called home uh, home to heaven or wherever you're supposed to go next. Uh, so anyway, um, do me a favor real quick as we get started. Please hit the like button, share button, and subscribe button. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, this is uh, this relates to uh, some stuff that I saw recently in BET. Um, my manager actually forwarded me uh, this article uh, that BET had written about uh, some, some commentary that I had put together about, you know, Tiffany Haddish. Uh, Tiffany Haddish is a great actress. Uh, she's a brilliant woman uh, in her own right. She's very, very good at what she does. Um, but also at the same time, uh, there are reasons to be disturbed about what we're seeing in media. And uh, I'm going to break that down for you real quick. Uh, as I do that, before I do that, uh, go ahead and please hit the thumbs up button. If you're on YouTube, hit the like, share, subscribe button, all that good stuff. And uh, let me shoot out a quick text message to uh, everybody who uh, follows the channel, stuff like that, because you know YouTube be hating. They love, they love as 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 uh, Michi X likes to say, YouTube be hating, you know, and they they uh they make it harder for me to give you notifications when we go live. So we got over three hundred thousand subscribers, but I don't know how many people they tell when I go live. So if you want to get a text notification when I go live or when I do my podcast, here's what you do: text the word voice to three one nine nine six. Text my name, Boyce, B-O-Y-C-E, to 31996. Somebody type that in, 31996. Text Boyce to 31996. While you do that, I'm going to send out the text message real quick, and then we're going to get it, we're gonna get it cracking. And we're going to address this Tiffany Haddish thing, uh, you know, for the Twitterverse. Uh, you know, it's, it's, people are talking about it a lot on Twitter, my tweet. So I, I want to make sure I elaborate so y'all motherfuckers can understand exactly where the fuck I'm coming from with this, that, that literally um, there's a clear analysis here on this issue. And I think black people need to kind of elevate our thinking and mature ourselves so we don't participate in our own genocidal self-destruction. So give me a second. Text boys to 31996 while I do this real quick. <clears throat> Let me see here. Okay, so we're ready now uh the text message is being sent out so now we can have a real conversation uh also on twitter uh there's a lot of people talking about it on twitter so if you want to follow the conversation on twitter you can go to my twitter page which is uh Doc dr boyce Watkins one dr boyce Watkins one and uh there's a lot of people on twitter talking about you know the, the tweet i didn't even know this many people were talking about it but i kind of figured okay well since everybody's talking about it let's talk about it let's let's get real with it let's let's really dig into it um, okay, L.A. says Night School was not funny. I, I didn't see Tiffany Haddish's movie Night School. Um, you know, I think t here's, a, here's a funny thing about Tiffany Haddish. Um, and I want to make this 100% clear. Two things. One, uh, I think Tiffany's very smart. Uh, I think she's brilliant at, in terms of, you know, kind of giving white people what they want. You know, giving white people, you know, that coon shit. Like, they love that. They love black people acting like monkeys and niggas. Like, they love that. They love seeing us degrade ourselves. They love seeing us. Uh, the black women, they love black women who will sexualize and show their ass at, at a drop of a hat uh, or, or engage in any kind of ridiculous behavior uh, that will uh, lead them to write them a big check. Uh, they love it when black men, uh, they, they don't want you behaving like a man, they want you behaving like a clown. That's what they like. They like black men who are clowns. And this is not new. You know, you can go back to slavery. Uh, back in slavery, there was this thing, Dr. Claude Anderson writes about it in Poweronomics and Black Labor, White Wealth, and also the Black History Reader. In slavery, there was something called meritorious manumission, meritorious manumission. Meritorious manumission was when slaves would get rewarded. You know, a slave could become very popular on the plantation by doing a few basic things. Number one, if you um, defended and protected white people, like if the house is on fire and you saved the master and his kids, then you would get rewarded for that. Uh, number two, uh, if you, uh, what is it? Uh, if you, um, oh my goodness, oh, entertain white people. If you make them laugh, make them sing, you know, you, you get up there and you sing, yes, I'm boss, yes, I'm boss, yes, I'm, yes, I'm boss, you know, like, what, what, uh, what uh, Tariq Nasheed did that with Roland Martin, you know that, uh, I dance with Massa, I did dancing, dancing with Massa, I don't remember the words, but you know what I'm talking about, right, so, so literally, if you entertain Massa, then Massa will take good care of you, 
Uh, oh, it was like, I dance, I dance, I dance, I dance, I dance, I dance with Massa. That's what he did. I thought that was so funny. Uh, shout out to Tariq on that one. Um, and uh, a third way you could get meritorious manumission is if you uh, if you told on the other slaves. Like if you told Massa that the slaves are about to revolt, then you would get rewarded for telling on the other slaves, right? So this is not new, right? There's always been rewards. See, we act like every black person is always treated the same. You, we act like when black people got lynched, every black person was a candidate for lynching. Every black person could e be lynched equally, and that's not true. Uh, if you served white folks, if you served their interests, if you allowed them to use you to uh, serve their own purpose, then they would love you the same way they love a horse or a dog. You know, like like you know, the horse is uh, is, is 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 you know is a companion for a man who loves to ride his horse. The dog is the man's best friend, right? So some black people were good dogs. You know, they, they positioned themselves to be an asset to the massa and the massa would reward them very, very well. In fact, there was one Negro who uh, back in the day who actually told on the other slaves during a revolt and they loved him so much. They were, they wanted so badly to reward him that they literally built a statue for this Negro. They put a statue of this black man in this racist white town. And and they were they so they treated him better than I mean, most white people didn't get a statue. They gave a statue to this Negro. This statue was up until like 1965, you know. <laughs> and so ultimately, meritorious manumission might mean you got a financial reward. It might mean that you got your freedom. Uh, it might mean it means might mean you got a commendation or some medal or some trophy or some shit, you know. Like so, this is not new. This is not new. So Tiffany Haddish. And again, this is not anti-Tiffany. I want to make this sure this is hundred percent clear. This is not anti-Tiffany. And this is and, and and I and also when I looked at the tweets, I saw a couple of people, they they kind of lean on this, like, oh, you're attacking a black woman. This is anti-black woman. And I was like, no, actually, this is very pro-black woman, <clears throat> because I don't believe that a black woman should have to um act like an ass and offer to suck a white man's dick in order to be successful in Hollywood. I believe that the black woman deserves the same rights as the white woman to be dignified in terms of how she achieves her success. I believe that a white a black woman should not have to go and talk publicly like as Tiffany has done on many occasions about how she's lusting after these white men in order to earn her opportunity to be successful. So actually this is very, very pro black woman, you know? So, uh, you know, I want to make sure that's a hundred percent clear and, and truth be told, <clears throat> it's not even anti Tiffany Haddish, you know, Tiffany Haddish, you know, she's just making her money. Tiffany is who she is. You know, Tiffany is exactly who she is. So when I make a commentary like this, I'm not asking Tiffany Haddish to change who she is. I'm not asking Tiffany Haddish to suddenly become somebody else. What I'm saying is we as a community have to identify the bullshit when we see it. We also have to, we have to transform in terms of what we believe is a, a fair and accurate representation of who we are. For example, you can't cheer on the idea of a black woman being over hypersexualized and then at the same time complain that black women are sexualized by white people. You can't, I mean, seriously, think about this. You can't, you can't sit and only cheer on the black women who are act in a certain way and then get mad when white people think that all black women are like that or, that, or, or somehow impose that on you. You can't disconnect the images presented in Hollywood from the images that people <clears throat> impose upon you when they're judging you as a human being. Like, for example, as a black man, I can't be okay with the idea of, of just ignorant, violent, destructive, genocidal images of the black man being presented with hip through hip hop all throughout the world. I can't support that and then be upset that when a black man goes on trial, the white people, they see ignorant, violent imagery uh, in that person. They see that person as the person, as the Negro they saw on TV. So ultimately, you know, you must understand why, why Holly, where Hollywood came from, why Hollywood was created. Why, how Hollywood works. Go read the book, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. Go read that book. It's not even an anti-Semitic book on any level. I think it was written by a Jewish man. So this is not anti-Semitic at all. This is not, oh, well, Hollywood's run by the Jews. We hate to, I don't even, I don't dislike the Jews at all. I, I think what they did was brilliant with the creation of Hollywood. But let me tell you this, Black people, Hollywood was created so they could socially engineer the world in which they live. They wanted to control the imagery of themselves to the world. They also wanted to control the imagery 
of other groups of people that they saw fitting whatever agenda they chose at that moment. So right now, for example, with black folks, it's the gay agenda is very, very big. You know, Hollywood, because, you know, they got the gay stuff and the pedophile rings and all that. A lot of your favorite your favorite male sex symbols, many of your favorite male sex symbols that you, you know, your ladies fantasize about and everything else because you think he's so sexy and all that and a good family man. A lot of these guys are bending over and taking it up the butt just so they can get a movie role. I mean, let, let's just be real. A lot of these guys ain't what it ain't what it appears to be. Let me just say that it ain't what you think it is. When I went out to Hollywood, I spent a lot of time out there. I said, I'm going to go back. I got to go back at home. I'm going back to Chicago because I don't totally understand this world. It's a nice place, nice people. Actors are very, very smart. Uh, they're very, very um, disciplined. Actors have a lot of discipline. I respect that. But, ooh, buddy, when they let their hair down, they go to a place that I, I just, I can't, I'm a black boy from Kentucky. I don't understand none of that shit. You know, y'all think Bill Cosby stuff was bad. They got Bill Cosby to the 10th power going on in Hollywood. It's kind of crazy. So anyway, <clears throat> uh, in case you just came in, we're talking about Tiffany Haddish. And um, and I, and I kind of wanted to go a little bit further uh, in, in terms of my analysis on this. I, I B, You know, BET wrote, wrote an article about a lot of people. Apparently, I didn't even know this was going on, but apparently there was a tweet I made about Tiffany Haddish uh, being the most popular slave on the plantation. Uh, you know, about Tiffany Haddish kind of reflecting the minstrel show. And, um, and so when I saw it, I said, oh, I didn't know it had gone viral. So let me go ahead and just make sure we elaborate so we can really have, you know, class in full session. Uh, intelligent black people will, will understand this. And, 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 and I know that not every black person is intelligent or wants to be intelligent. Uh, many of our community, many people in our community are addicted to ignorance. In fact, there are people whose attention spans are so short, their brains have been whittled away so badly that their attention spans are so short <clears throat> that they can't even get more than three minutes into this video, right? So those people, I, I, can't, I can't talk to them. I'm not, that's not really who this is for. It's really for people that kind of want to understand this and want to grow and expand and want to think things through. Everybody else is just going to be frustrated because I'm kind of the wet blanket on the party. Uh, and so anyway, <clears throat> City King, you're asking who, what we're talking about. We're talking about Tiffany Haddish and uh, why Tiffany Haddish represents the ultimate menstrual show. So do this. Make sure you hit the uh, like button, the share button, and the subscribe button. Uh, please, uh, if you're on uh, YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button. Also hit that notifications button and the subscribe button and all that stuff so that you can know when we go live. Uh, last but not least, I want to remind you guys, I'll be in Houston uh, with Dr. Venetia Dutra speaking on black wealth strategies uh, the uh, on December 8th. So if you want to know more, go to drboycehouston.com. That's drboycehouston.com. Uh, so, so, you know, a couple of things that Tiffany Haddish did, and this is not anti-Tiffany, again, I want to reiterate that, and it's not anti, it's certainly not anti-Black woman, it's actually pro-Black woman, um, is uh, I saw, you know, I, I saw some interesting comments that she made that certainly will earn her her meritorious manumission. You know, they will certainly earn her accolades from white folks to get her bigger paychecks. Uh, she seems to be really obsessed with, uh, with these white men. Like, she talks a lot about white men. Let me show you guys a tweet that I saw from Tiffany back, this is back in 2014, though, when she was trying to fake it till she made it or trying to get big. The tweet doesn't have very many, uh, you know, likes or anything. So it's, I guess it shows when she wasn't that big yet. But look at this. It says, nothing like having a strong white man pick you up every now and then. Nothing like having a strong white man pick you up every now and then. And then the hashtag is she ready and last black unicorn. Now, I don't know what that means exactly. And I hit the Instagram link to kind of look at the image, um, I and the, the, the image is gone. The white man that she's referring to is gone. Um, so I, I guess that's how they clean it up a little bit after you become famous. But, you know, it's, it's like she's got this weird obsession with white men, you know. And then later on, she, she was making these really sexually aggressive uh, comments um, about Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, in fact, let me find... Yeah, there, here's an article. Let me, I, I'll screen share this so you guys can see this too. There's an article here where it says, um, Tiffany Haddish asked Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, if they'd sleep with her, right? And, uh, and so if you read down, it says, comedian actor Tiffany Haddish, who appears on the cover of the latest issue of The Hollywood Reporter, um, recounted her stories of how she was, or she has been propositioning two of the biggest stars in the world of entertainment. She says she met Leonardo DiCaprio at a party two or three months ago and cornered him with demands. Quote, I asked him if he'd, if he'd let me hit that. So that's what she said. She, she said, I asked him if he'd let me hit that. 
he's like, Tiffany, you're so funny. I'm like, I'm serious. And then he goes, I mean, I do, I, I do it. But I was like, come on, wasn't you in the squad, the coochie squad or something she said? And then she took it a step further by providing details of the hypothetical tryst. I told him, my only stipulation I want to do it with, with you, at, uh, sorry, my only stipulation, I want to do it with you as your character in What's Eating Gilbert Grape, she said. He starts busting up laughing. Why, he asks. And I say, because I feel like that performance deserves a real reward. And that reward is this. And she gestures at her own body. So that reward is this. So, um, so basically what she's saying, you know, in this joke, I know it's a joke. It's a joke, but it ain't a joke, right? It's funny, but it ain't funny, right? You see what I mean? I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's just jokes. Yes, but is it really just a joke, right? So she's basically saying, you know, I want to give you my, I'm going to give you pussy because, uh, because you did a good job in this movie. Um, and, you know, and, and it's funny. People think that's hilarious. Like, oh, this, you know, look at this. Ha, ah, she's so hilarious. She's such a, and, and I don't really know. I don't really know. I'm not, I just, I mean, again, I'm not going to say um that it wouldn't be the same if she were a white woman maybe if she were a white woman and she made the same comment it would be funny then too i'm sure there's been uh fat ugly white women or regular white women or whatever who have made jokes like that about you know hollywood um sex symbols and and that's fine but i think that there's something to this idea that she's going out of her way to really sort of you know connect herself you know psychologically and otherwise with these white men uh remember halle berry halle berry did not get uh, in award, she did not get her Oscar until she went and did that nasty ass sex scene with Billy Bob Thornton in Monsters Ball. I mean, until she hold herself, I mean, hold herself to the nth degree in that movie. And so she, you know, so there, there's something to this. There's something to this. Um, if you look at uh, these images, I want to show you pictures here of, okay, so I want you to kind of look at like sort of a, a, a menstrual show blackface image, right? Uh, and, and, and anybody who kind of has an issue with uh, critiques of Tiffany Haddish should really go study menstrual shows. So you kind of know what you're talking, so you know kind of what you're referencing, right? Because a lot of times what uh, is most damaging for black people is the stuff that seems cool. It seems okay at the time. It's just like, oh, it's just entertainment. And anybody who understands how the brain works knows that there's no such thing as just entertainment. Anybody who understands even the basics of psychology knows that images are everything. How you see yourself, how you present it in media matters. Right. So look at this. And then I want you to look at this image. So look at Tiffany. Right. It's kind of like this, like outrageous. I got my tongue out because I mean, my God, I'm a hoe and ain't no telling what I'm gonna do with this big old tongue I got. Right. And because the, I mean, in fact, again, we, and we remember we are a community that consistently, um, you know, gets upset. We get very upset over the idea of black women being sexualized by media. We don't like that. But if I'm not mistaken, uh, in a uh, girl's trip, wasn't Tiffany Haddish basically training them on how to suck a penis? I mean, what wasn't Tiffany Haddish like really like going in and really doing like legendary scenes on how to like take that sucker down your throat? You know, like, you know, and, and so again, again, you know, you go into the, the, these, these sin weird situations where on one hand, we are cheering on the sexualization of the black woman. Well, on the other hand, we're getting upset about the over hypersexualization of the black woman. Which one is it? Which one do you, I mean, which one do you want? What, 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 what do we, what do we want to represent as a community? It doesn't mean that there's not a role for a Tiffany Haddish in the world, but I want to ask you this. Let me ask you, and this is, and this is, again, this is not anti-Tiffany. Again, Tiffany's just being who she is. This is really more of a conversation about white supremacy. Why white supremacy, why white supremacists love Tiffany Haddish. Um, because, because here's the thing, at the end of the day, Tiffany is, is not so much, um, she's not the only one. Out, there are thousands and thousands of talented black actresses in Hollywood. I've met them. I'm, I'm talking about pre, just as pretty, just as funny. Like uh, Tierra K.J. Williams, uh, you, for example, she runs the Real Network. She, she goes by the name Miss Black Hollywood. She's funnier to me than Tiffany Haddish. She's, she, 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 you know, she's prettier. She is more talented. She's put in the years. But uh, there are certain roles that I know Tierra would not ever take. There are certain things I know Tierra would not do. And I also know that she's been in the same spaces as uh, with the managers. Again, most of these are white and Jewish managers. These are not black managers that manage these people. Uh, but she's been in the space with these managers who say, oh, I could make you the next Halle. Or, oh, I could make you the next Taraji. Or I can make you the next Tiffany Haddish. And from what I've gathered, in these conversations, it usually gets to the point where they're kind of like, 
okay, are you ready to play ball? Like, are you ready to do, are you ready to make the ultimate sacrifice, whatever that is, right? Remember, y'all, I don't know if y'all recall this. Do y'all remember this? The, the manager of, uh, of Halle, the guy that used to manage Halle Berry that I think still might manage Taraji, he got caught up in a whole lot of situations where basically he was telling the actresses, look, you, you know, you, you, you suck it. You, you suck this, this wrinkly penis every, you know, every two or three weeks. Uh, I can make you as famous as you want to be. You know, you get with me in my bedroom every now and then. I can make things happen for you. Let me see here. Let me, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, let me see. Manager. He, it was like Me Too. What was it? Sexual harassment. That's what it was. Let me Google that. That's what I'll Google. Let me see if I can find this guy's name. I'm, I'm trying to Google this. Here we go. Um, he helped Halle Berry and Taraji Henson to stardom. Now, let me see. Now nine minority women are accusing him of sexual harassment. This is the guy. No, no, I mean, this is this is not, again, this is not to point out or to critique anybody, Halle or Taraji, but it kind of makes you think any intelligent person, intelligent people are going to get this. And, you know, any intelligent person is going to be like, well, damn, how did you, how did you get it? How did you get through? How did you get through the training program? Like, why did you come out with flying colors, girl? What, what happened? And again, it's not even more to demean them. It's really demeaning the system and the process and getting an understanding of, 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 of the fact that there should not be credibility or validity given to any of these awards that are given to Black people in Hollywood because in many cases, the price that they pay to get the awards uh, are based on whether they're willing to jump over ethical boundaries. So the people you should be cheering for are not necessarily always the people on stage. The people we should be cheering for in many cases should be the people who were put off the stage. You don't always, you, you probably in many cases shouldn't just fall for the temptation to cheer for the appropriate Negro. You should probably take some time to show appreciation for the Negro who was defined to be inappropriate. Or, or 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 not a good fit for Hollywood, right? You know, so so don't cheer for the house Negro, cheer for the field Negro. The field Negro was the one who who stood up to Massa, and that's why he's in the field. The, you know, there's a lot of actors and actresses in Hollywood who are very very talented who will never get a chance to be a Tiffany Haddish, never get a chance to be a Taraji, uh, because they went into the audition and somebody said, okay, girl, drop your pants, drop your drawers, or or let me see what that mouth do. And she said, no, thank you. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I, I, I want to be evaluated based on my talent and not based on what I'm going to do for you in the bedroom. So let me read this to you. Tamika Lamison was a 27-year-old stage actress living in New York City in 19, June 96 when she stepped into Hollywood manager's Vincent, Vincent Sorrentioni. He ain't black, by the way. He ain't black. Uh, his hotel suite. Excited by the unexpected opportunity to audition for the man behind Halle Berry's rising stardom. Lamison said she had been introduced to this guy, his name, I can't pronounce it, uh, the previous night by one of his clients at the Tony Awards dinner. Soon after her arrival at the hotel, Sorrentioni's phone rang. It was Barry. He put the famous actress on the speaker, on speaker as Lamison listened in silently in awe, thinking that perhaps Sorrentioni could steer her own acting career to Hollywood success in an industry with few leading roles for African-American actresses like her. So this is how, this is like the grooming process. You know, this is kind of what, similar to what a child molester does. Cause you know, Hollywood's really good with grooming your children. That's why if you, if your child ever becomes an actor or actresses do not, or actress, do not leave their side. Do not leave their side the entire time. Do not let them go in the company of a manager. Do not let that manager have a big sleepover with all the other famous kids. Don't fall for the hype or your child will have a level of trauma that will never go away. Uh, so, so that, so they, it's the same way you, you know, they groom the kids, they groom uh, young women as well. Uh, so anyway, so he's grooming her. He's trying, he's, he's subtly impressing her by putting Hallie on the phone so that she'll kind of understand, you know, the price of success, right? So in the, when the call ended, Lamison began reciting a poem he had written. Midway through her performance, she said, Sorrentione grabbed her and started kissing her, sticking his tongue in her mouth. She said, he told her that he could take her on as a client on the condition that he would get to see her for sex whenever he wanted. She said she pushed him away and left. Lamison is among nine women, eight African-Americans and one Asian-American. So this guy apparently had a thing for black women. He saw his position in Hollywood as his opportunity to access lots and lots of black women uh, because he, in his mind, felt like, okay, wait, I'm a rich white man and I need to go find some broke-ass black women 
So just like they do when they go to third world countries, when they go on these European sex vacations and all that, what they're doing is, or, or people that go spend all, a bunch of time in Thailand and stuff like that, what they're doing is they're looking for poor people uh, that will trade sex for money. So they look at the black community like a third world country within the United States, where it's like, we can go get these super talented people who have no, who broke as fuck, who value money over everything. You know, cash, cash moves everything around me. Cream, get the money. Dollar, dollar bill, y'all, right? Like, like you value money over everything and you don't have any money. So the, if you ever want to be in a position of complete vulnerability, do this. Here's what you do if you ever want to be a slave. If you ever want to be a complete slave to the white man, here's what you do value the things that he holds in abundance, but yet you don't hold uh, in nearly the abundance that you deserve. Value the things that he holds, uh, that he's got a lot of, that you have very little of. If you, if, if you value, if you really value the things that he has and devalue the things you have, then he's going to have all the power. You're not going to have the power. It's like if, if oil is the most valuable commodity in the world, because let's say we just all need oil, then who's going to have the most wealth? It's going to be the country that has the most oil, right? So when you value those dollar bills and, and don't value anything in your own community, then you become a slave to the community that can provide you with the thing that you value the most. And are you with me? Do you follow me? Just like if, uh, if, if, if there's a woman who uh, needs to hear, if she doesn't believe she's pretty, she can't generate her own self-esteem. She never got it from her father. She never got it from her loved ones, right? And she needs to feel pretty. She needs somebody to tell her that she's pretty. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Anybody know somebody like that who needs a man? She only feels pretty if her husband tells her that she's pretty. It has to come from him. Nobody else, right? And let's say her husband's an abusive asshole. Well, he's going to use that leverage to control her. He's going to use that. It, it, you know, when she's acting right, he'll say, oh, you are so beautiful. Oh, my God. She's like, oh. You thank you so much. I needed that. And then when she gets out of line, she does something you don't like. You're like, yo, ugly bitch. If I don't want you, ain't nobody gonna want you, you ugly ass. Right? Because he knows he's got that ability to control her with that. So let me keep going. Let me keep going. Uh, so let me read more of this uh, Washington Post article because I think this is really important. This kind of speaks to Hollywood and kind of how it all works. Um, so basically, this guy, Sorincioni, uh, you know, he he basically uh, was, you know, they, they said several said they viewed Sorrentione, who was white, as an important gatekeeper for black actresses in an industry notoriously difficult to break into, one whose path is even more narrow for minorities. So basically, black actresses saw this guy as the guy you got to go, the go-to man to get an opportunity to get into Hollywood. And he said, okay, the price is your pussy. You know, if, if you can't pay up, if you can't pay up, then you know, pay the cost of admission, then you, you don't get in here. So, you know, so what this does is I, I thought about this when I saw Tiffany Haddish making these open, ho just, I mean, straight up hoish overtures to all these white men in Hollywood, like literally putting the white man on this pedestal, like I will do anything for you. I, I come cheap. I am, um, I am your personal slut because I just want to be up next to you. And let me tell you why, again, this is not anti-Tiffany, um, and this is not anti-Black woman at all. This is actually pro-Black woman. And actually, Tiffany has the right to be whoever she is. What I'm referring to is the way she, uh, the image of the Black woman is portrayed in Hollywood. When, you know, one of the kickers, one of the most telling things that happened recently in Hollywood is when um, Tiffany Haddish was up for, I think, Best Supporting Actress. Angela Bassett. Angela Bassett, the iconic Angela Bassett, the talented Angela Bassett, went to, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, went to Yale to study drama. The Yale drama student, Angela Bassett, was up for the same award, same damn award, and these white folks gave it to Tiffany Haddish. These white folks gave it to Tiffany Haddish. I, I, don't, I can't remember if it was an Emmy or an, I, I don't remember what the hell it was, but I, I, think, I think it was an Academy Award. Let me see here. I'm looking for it. I can't I can't find it here. Um, but I believe it was uh, an Emmy or an Oscar. One of those two. One of those two made up awards. They, they, they literally if you read the history of these awards, um, if you read the history of how these awards uh, work, basically, uh, if you read the, how the Jews invented Hollywood, 
in that book, they talk about where the Oscars and the Emmys and all that bullshit came from. They basically um, came from the fact that the Hollywood executives wanted to create something, make something up to make the actors not focus on uh, the fact that they weren't getting paid enough money. So they were like, let's just scratch their asses and let's give them some, give them some kind of award so that they'll feel good about themselves. And that's where all that stuff came from. So uh, let's see, somebody saying she does not have an Oscar. Somebody says it was at the BET Awards. Was it the BET Awards? It was some award. And, uh, and it was Best Supporting Actress, if I'm not mistaken. And they gave it to Angela Bassett. Obviously, they gave it to Tiffany Haddish over Angela Bassett. Nowhere on this earth, nowhere on any surrounding planet, nowhere in this fucking universe should Angela Bassett even have to compete with a Tiffany Haddish. Nowhere. Nowhere. I mean, sure, you can make her, you know, make her the clown. Let her be the clown, but she can't be the queen. She ain't the queen. Angela Bassett is an actress that had not only has a tremendous amount of talent, but she has carried herself uh, with an extraordinary amount of dignity throughout her entire career. Um, I can't imagine. I would be stunned if, if Angela couldn't tell a million stories about roles that she just would not take to make more money. Um, she has been... Uh, you know, uh, not respected in Hollywood the way she deserves it. Uh, but but again, it's up to us to exalt the people that we respect. It's not up to them. That's why the creation of a black Hollywood is a must. That's why it is an absolute must in this generation. We must create it. We must support it. We must support black filmmakers who give respect to the esteemed actors and actresses that come from our community because white folks ain't going to do it. There's a whole graveyard full of, of previous A-list black actors who fell out of favor with Hollywood and they just take their brands and throw them in the garbage. They take the things that you hold dear, the things that you love and admire the most, and they treat it like trash. Let me give you an example. I happen to know a couple of people who are on the show A Different World. And uh, I did not know this, but did you know that A Different World, this show that you consider to be yours, that you consider to be iconic, that you just love so much, that you just think is so black, it is very black. But did you know that A Different World is not on any level owned by any black people. Warner Brothers, if I'm not mistaken, owns a different world. Warner Brothers owns a different world. So when all the actors and actresses from a different world, when a bunch of them came together and said, hey, you're doing all these reboots, you're doing reboots on, uh, you know, on uh, Roseanne, you're doing reboots on all these other white shows, why don't you do a reboot on a different world? There's lots of people who'd like to see it. Warner Brothers said, eh, nah, we don't want to do that. So then when they said, well, why don't we come up, we'll come up with the money, you know, we'll pay a licensing fee, we'll, we'll put it out there, we'll, we'll do a blah, 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 you know, just let us take it over because black people love this, they, they need this, they need shows like this. They were like, nah, nah, Negroes, just go away, we, we're just going to, we're just going to keep it up on the shelf. We, we just, we just, we, this is our shit, we're going to put it, and do you know that, do you know that Jasmine Guy, tell, I'm going to tell you how, they, how bad they got that shit on lockdown. Jasmine Guy cannot even imitate the voice of Whitley Gilbert in public without possibly being sued for copyright violations. Did you know that? She can't even, if, if she goes on stage somewhere and comes on and pretends to be Whitley, like, hey, y'all, where's the wine? Do you know that they will sue her? She can't even use the, they copyright, they got a copyright on Whitley's accent. That's how deep they went with it. It's insanity. It's absolutely insanity. Now, anyway, anyway, I saw somebody ask a question about the YouTube channel. I want to answer the question. Um, by the way, uh, you are watching drboystv.com. So uh, if you want to subscribe, if you're on Instagram, uh, you want to be part of the party, uh, go subscribe at drboystv.com. Um, let me see here. Uh, somebody said, uh, Boyce, I want to know if I sign up for you, your YouTube commercial free based on listening to you and a few others, do you get credit or acknowledgement for that? Uh, you know, Ava, not to my knowledge, I don't know anything about that. Um, last I checked, last time I, know, I checked, the, the, you know, all that goes to YouTube, but maybe there's something that they give. I don't know. It's not very much. Like, YouTube channels don't make a ton of money. I don't really do YouTube as, you know, to make money. Um, it's really something where it's like, it's a good way to connect with people. I'm a big believer in the creation of of distribution channels, digital grapevines where black folks can kind of connect to each other. So uh, that's why we built up a few hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube. 
Uh, but if you do want to support, you know, which really does help us, it helps us. We have a lot of black people that we pay to do different things. So we do create jobs for, for black folks. Uh, if you want to support, you know, if you're spending all this money on Black Friday, if you spend a little bit of money with us, we'd appreciate it. Uh, a couple ways you could do that. One, you could uh, su support the channel by subscribing at intelligentblackpeople.com. That's intelligentblackpeople.com. That's an account where uh, it would be a small monthly amount that uh, that would uh, go toward us being able to push the message of black intelligence all throughout the world. We are, our gospel is black economic empowerment and black intelligence. Those are two things that we deeply believe in. We believe in creating more and more intelligent black people and also teaching black people to be economically smart. So uh, if you believe in that message and you want to support, uh, we'd love it if you, you know, if you went to intelligentblackpeople.com and, and became a member and we'll give you benefits that come with that as well. We don't, we don't actually do charity. We'll, we don't really believe in accepting charity. Uh, we believe in accepting trade though. We would love for you to trade with us as much as you trade with Target and Walmart and everybody else, you know, for things like Black Friday. A uh, second thing you could do if you want is our, our main corporate sponsor. One of our big sponsors is the Black Business School. Uh, if you uh, want your family to get um, a, a premium business education uh, that, that is better than any university in America for black people, uh, you can go to uh, the Black Business School, theblackbusinessschool.com. There are several classes. We have a black business school for children. We have a black law school for, uh, for people that don't want to be lawyers but want to know the law. We have courses on everything from how to start your business to how to um, invest in the stock market and all these things. So feel free to go to theblackbusinessschool.com. It's theblackbusinessschool.com. Okay, so today we're talking about Tiffany Haddish and uh, whether or not Tiffany represents the ultimate menstrual show. And I'm responding to uh, some of the conversation that happened on Twitter. Apparently, uh, I didn't even know this. I got an article from my manager, Michelle, that BET uh, kind of, you know, they, that they wrote a piece about you know, about the tweet and the reactions to the tweet. And I went and I said, oh, I didn't know this tweet had gone viral. And I looked down and there's thousands of people talking about it. So I felt like it was worth kind of following up on this conversation. And I'm going to say this, you know, the people that defend, you know, and I said this on Twitter, uh, which my Twitter is at Dr. Boyce Watkins one, the number one at the end. Uh, just go to Dr. Boyce Watkins one and you can join the conversation if you want to be a part of that. But one of the things I said is, I said, people who defend this kind of coonery are basically the same people who hold a protest whenever black people demand that they get rid of the neighborhood liquor store. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, you see, coonery is addictive. You know, uh, laughter is uh, a natural opioid, uh, opioid that kind of uh, releases endorphins that, that make you feel better. It helps you numb the pain, right? It helps you forget about the struggle of being black. So in fact, I'm a, a big advocate of laughter. I love to laugh. I think laughing is fun, laughing is cool. Um, I think that what it, be it becomes, though, is it's almost like with drugs, like drugs can heal you and make you better, but drugs can also turn you into an addict, right? Drugs can, can either give you life or they can move you closer to death, right? So comedy can either give you life and happiness and fulfillment, or it can actually degrade and harm your community more than it actually benefits you. There, there, there's a price that, uh, that can be too high to pay just for the chance to laugh. Right. So while we can certainly support comedians, there are lots of comedians that are, you know, funny as hell, conscious, you know, and some not so conscious who are still funny as hell. Like Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor was not conscious. Right. Richard Pryor was kind of ridiculous in some ways. Richard Pryor could easily be critiqued in terms of like people saying, OK, man, all right, let's not go too far. Right. Um, but at the same time, Richard Pryor was very funny. Most of us grew up laughing at Richard Pryor, just like all of us, all of us can watch Tiffany Haddish and laugh. I watch Tiffany Haddish. Every time I see Tiffany, I start laughing. I, I will, I, I must lay that out there on the table. When I see Tiffany, I always laugh because she's funny as hell. But just because I'm laughing, that doesn't mean that we don't stop and take a moment and reflect and say, okay, maybe we need to slow our roll a little bit. Maybe we need to slow down and kind of pay attention to how much this, uh, this imagery is impacting our people. Maybe we have to have a code of conduct or some boundaries that, uh, that all Hollywood actors and actresses have to commit to. Like, look, we'll go so far, but we're not going to go too far. You know, we're going to push the limits, but we're not going to go over the cliff. We're going to go hard. We're going to be funny as hell, but we black before we're anything else. Right? And that very ideal is not only unpopular among certain segments of the community, people that have no standards, um, but also, you know, it's, it's, it's something that 
I think causes conflict, you know, in terms of how we interact with each other. There are people that get mad. They'll be like, oh, why are you, why you can't laugh? It's just a joke. She's just being funny. Why you can't be happy for, for her? She's finally getting money. Well, I'm like, well, shit, if getting money is the only thing that matters in this fucking world, then why don't we all get wrap up our daughters and put them on the corner and say, pussy for sale, and sell our daughters to any man with, with a hard penis within a hundred mile radius. Why don't we do that? If, if getting money is all that matters, then why don't you go bundle up a box of crack cocaine and go down to the local elementary school while the kids are, are young and impressionable and find the kids that don't have good parents that are watching them and get them hooked on crack. They'll be customers for life, dog. You make crazy money after that, right? Like, I mean, seriously, if money is everything, then there's a million ways to make your money. I know this. I, why do I know this? Because I'm a finance professor. I have a PhD in finance. I understand money at a level that you cannot imagine. And the thing about it, too, is that you don't just learn where the money's at, how it works, how to obtain it, or whatever it is. You also learn the dangers, the dangers that come into play when you start worshiping the dollar bill. You learn that money money is really is truly is power money is power you hear people say it all the time but people don't really know what that means they don't process in terms of what that really means the idea that money is power means that money is powerful like like fire fire can either um warm your food you know warm you up cook your food right or it can burn you alive right money's like a drug you know drugs can heal you make you better or turn you into Pookie the Crackhead, right? So you have to understand that this whole paper chase, like money over everything, is 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 really about as close to unhealthy financial addiction as there is, as there as, as there can be. And here's the other thing: here's a little secret that Black folks need to understand: the dangers of economic addiction. The danger of economic addiction is that most of the thing that you're addicted to, most of the money that you are addicted to that you suck it up like a crack pipe, most of that's controlled by the very same people that used to lynch and castrate and murder your ancestors. These, these are the very same white folks that you complaining about every day because they're oppressing you. These are the very same white folks that make you mad because she clutched her purse in the elevator or called you a nigga the other day. Or or the same white folks where you go to work and you pissed off because because you got a white boss who don't respect you, who mistreat you, right? Or the, or the same white folks who support the police department after they shoot a black man. So the very same people who oppress you are the same people who control the thing that you're addicted to. And you're okay with that addiction. To understand this a little deeper, I want you to imagine this. Imagine if you um, had a daughter and your daughter um, was hungry and she needed food and the only person willing to feed her was the neighborhood pimp. Would your daughter be in an, in an empowered situation? If she needs food, she needs food. And the pimp's like, hey girl, I got food. I got cheeseburgers. I got I got greens, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, hams, yams, chicken, 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 chicken. Right, he's like, I got anything you need, girl. All you gotta do is play ball. All you gotta do is just do what I tell you and I can make sure you eating good. Well, that's what they do to your famous actors and actresses. That's exactly what they do in Hollywood. You got your oppressor pimp who controls the thing that you need the most, the thing that you're addicted to, because you grew up believing money was more important than everything. Money's more important than your dignity. Money's more important than your community. Money's more important than anything. So they, they control this money. They're like, we got money to burn. We're Hollywood. We're made out of money. We'll give you everything you want. We will make your dreams come true. As long as you're willing to play ball. As long as you do what we say. So what happens is you think that you're you think you're about that walking toward money is walking you toward freedom. When actually walking toward the money in that particular situation is walking into slavery. There are a lot of black people in Hollywood who make millions of dollars a year who are not free at all who are less free now than they would have been if they'd never been adopted by Hollywood in the first place. You think, I mean, well, why do you think some of these black actors and actresses go after Hollywood and lose their damn mind and go crazy? 
Why do you think Dave Chappelle turned down fifty million dollars to go run off to Africa for six weeks or whatever it was there six months, whatever it was he did? He, you know, he walked away from all that money. People were like, why would you run away from all that money? That's crazy, man. What's wrong with you? Because Dave Chappelle's a smart man. Dave Chappelle said, "You, you know, I, I like the money, but you're trying, but the price you're asking me to pay to get this money is too high for me. I can, I'm not gonna do this." And and I applaud that man for that. And the thing about Dave Chappelle that I admire is that Dave Chappelle is a guy that seems to know how to have his, his success. I mean, he got a massive deal from Netflix. He's making millions of dollars. He can have his success, but have his freedom too. He's not selling everything in order to uh, make a couple of dollars. So Dave Chappelle is in a different space from, you know, say Tiffany Haddish. Um, and really, you know, I mean, people talk about that, the, the male counterpart of Tiffany, you got to talk about, you know, some of what Kevin Hart does. You know, some of what Kevin Hart does, you know, he's the cowardly little black sidekick. Um, that's not exactly the best image for the black man either. They want to see the black man as a little, little, little uh, as comic relief. They want to see him as a little pussy and wimp. That's what they like to do. The, black, the white man is the hero. The black man is the coward. The white man runs to the danger to fight the bad guys. The black guy runs away because he's scared like a little bitch, right? Even in um, even when I watched uh, oh gosh, Fast and Furious, which those are good movies. I like those movies, right? But you know, you have these as kind of the leaders. You have these sort of racially ambiguous guys. You know, they're not quite white, but they're not black really either. It's kind of like a you're not really sure what they are, right? So they can sell in global markets. The Rock and uh, Vin Diesel, right? And then you have the white guy, the white, the one that died, right? He and he was kind of the main one. And then I guess they put the rock in there because after you know after he died, right? So so you got these sort of these culturally or these racially ambiguous guys that are the the you know the tough guys, uh, you know the heroes. And then you got Ludacris and Tyrese who are unambiguously black. I mean, there's no question about what their ethnicity is, right? Or or at least there's no you're not going to mistake them for white boys, right? And they are in the background. Uh, they are inferior to the alpha males. They follow the orders of, of, the, of the, the lighter skinned guys, right? The guys who are closer to white. This is a Eurocentric standpoint. Um, and also they're cowards. You know, whenever the shit really goes down, whenever it gets really crazy, Tyrese is usually off in the corner screaming like a little bitch. Um, they did the same thing in the Transformers movie. I, uh, I wrote an article about it, and, uh, and I remember a million people read it. The people from the Transformers movie actually contacted me uh, to ask me to, like, tone it down. But I wrote an article about one of the Transformers movies. Uh, I think it was part two or part three, where they literally had two uh, coons, two coon Transformers who literally fulfilled every racial stereotype imaginable. They were, they, 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 you know, when, when, when it came time to make a plan, they couldn't make a plan because they were too busy fighting over something stupid like a piece of chicken. Um, they were uh, always the first ones to run away and get scared whenever the danger came. They were uh, stupid as hell, you know, and literally <clears throat> the parallel is they basically, that they were basically like, you know, Tyrese's character. And I would say to some extent, Luda's character, even though Luda's character is like the computer genius guy, right? Which is cool, which actually fits him. It's like, so it becomes a hybrid between the step and fetch it role and the um, the role that say Morgan Freeman plays in Batman, right? He's uh, this one dimensional asexual character. Like you, ever, you ever, when you ever watch a Batman movie, have you ever, ever seen Morgan Freeman's wife? Have you ever seen him like have any life other than serving the white man who goes out and actually fights the superheroes, right? Um, what's another, Samuel Jackson? Nick Fury, his character in the Avengers, you know, uh, you see uh, Nick, you know, Nick Fury is, you know, he's like the help. He's like the supporter of these white people. He brings them all together and they all go fight. So he's kind of like the mammy that runs the house in that kind of role, you know, uh, you know, a little bit like, like Django a little bit, kind of what um, he played in Django. It's just a different dynamic, but similar, right? It's like, he's got a little authority with the white folks. Like he can kind of tell them what to do because they respect him because they love him. But at the same time, he's still the subordinate. He's still the subordinate to them, right? So literally, actually, if you really break it down and look at it closely, Samuel's character in um, The Avengers isn't that much different from the character he had in Django, except the Django character was just a little more vicious and a little more, um, uh, a little more ridiculous, right, in certain ways, right? But, but anyway, so, so going back to that point, um, you know, it, it's like this is a common thing. This is kind of how the whole minstrel show ideology kind of comes together. Um, 
Now, let's see here. So somebody says Lucius Fox is a three-dimensional character in the comics and the Batman movie he wasn't. Okay. Well, that again, that's the difference between Hollywood and maybe what the comic books will portray, right? Uh, what I'm talking about is what's portrayed on screen. Most people that know the Avengers have never read any of the comic books. Most people that know the Avengers don't go and say, I want to go get um, the Iron Man comic series now, or I want to go read about Thanos and, you know, and everything. Like, they, we just see the movie and we see the imagery that's portrayed on the screen. Even if you go into um, Black Panther, same thing. You know, you had, um, you know, you had the African pitted against the African-American. Like, like you got these healthy, wholesome people uh, in Wakanda who, who, are, who love white folks. You know, like they got all this power, but they're gonna help. They're gonna help white people, and they're they're defending white people against Killmonger. Killmonger is the crazy nigga who wants to get revenge. He's the slave who realizes that white folks owe reparations, and that white people are oppressing black people around the world. So think about the imagery in the movie Black Panther. Think about what the whole premise of the film was. Think about what you were fighting for, what you were rooting for. You had the quote unquote good guys who were defending white folks from this evil, crazy Negro who grew up in the hood, you know, who had no parents, who uh, had no respect for anything that was decent and civil. Um, and and they, pay attention. Now, Killmonger was saying, Killmonger wasn't even saying, let's go just kill a bunch of white folks. But he didn't say that. Killmonger said, they're oppressing our people around the world. Our people around the world are suffering because you're not using your resources to help them. You don't care about these people because you want to keep it to yourself. That's what Killmonger was saying, right? And, and so, <clears throat> so they were fighting and defend. They they killed him because he wanted to go and liberate black people. And y'all were sitting there cheering along with the white folks, right? But some people didn't. Some black folks are awake enough to say, "Wait a minute, Killmonger actually had a point. I actually like Kill. I think he he was my hero. I was cheering for him. I wouldn't." No, no, I liked him more than I liked the other guy, right? Some black folks kind of got that, right? Again, intelligent black people can see this. But people who fall for brainwashing, I think, don't understand how Hollywood programs you to remain oppressed. It rewards, it, it, it gives you, it rewards you for going out and reaching for your good nigga sticker. That's why you got movies like The Help and The Butler. And Oprah loves movies like that. Look at her movie, A Wrinkle in Time. She's basically a mammy to these white kids. Right. Denzel Washington. Love this guy. Great actor. Love Oprah, too. But Denzel, a lot of his movies, he's saving a white kid. Right. <laughs> like that's kind of the, the sort of standard protocol. Where does that come from? It comes from slavery. Meritorious manumission. Go look it up. Go read up on it. Dr. Claude Anderson talks about it in Black Labor, White Wealth and Powernomics. Meritorious manumission was when black slaves would get rewarded for saving white people, for saving and protecting white people. Well, why is it that in 1605, a black man or 1650 or whatever, a black man or black woman could get rewarded for saving and protecting white people. And in 2018, a black man or black woman can be rewarded for saving and protecting white people. It's not, ain't nothing changed. It's, it's the same damn thing. Anyway, do this. Um, hit the thumbs up button. If you're on YouTube, please take a second and hit the thumbs up button. I'm gonna look at some of your comments while I do that. Uh, let's see. Hey, Vicky Dillard. Good to see you. Tell me how you are doing, sister. I was thinking about you and, 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 uh, and wishing you well, and I hope that you're feeling okay. Um, so, uh, please hit the thumbs up button. Uh, also thank you, Vicky. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, if you want to be on the text message list or so I can text you when I go live, please go to uh, text the word voice to 31996, 31996. Also, if you um, are on YouTube and you did not get a notification when I went, went live, a notification from YouTube, just go and make sure the bell is hit. There's a little bell. Uh, if you go to uh, drboycetv.com, <clears throat> you should see the channel. And on that channel, there should be a little bell. And uh, look to make sure that little bell is hit if you want to be notified whenever I go live. Um, it's kind of a, a, a duck and dodge game with YouTube, right? I, I get banned. I get I get put in Facebook jail a lot and banned from stuff because I just say stuff, I guess, that's too black and scares white people. And so somebody always gets mad about it. But it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> so let me let me say this, too. Oh, also, if, I, if you're in Houston, I want to remind you guys of this. If you're in Houston, I'll be in Houston December 8th. You can learn more at drboycehouston.com. That's drboycehouston.com. 
Also, uh, once uh, Michi X, uh, she's looking for a venue for us to do something in Denver, actually. Uh, I think that's going to be actually around the turn of the month. I got to check the date. But uh, once I get that ready or find out about that, <clears throat> I'll link the information at drboysdenver.com, drboysdenver.com. Okay. So anyway, um, one of the things that uh, I want to make sure is, is 100% clear is that, you know, a critique on Tiffany Haddish's portrayal by Hollywood is not a critique on Tiffany herself. Tiffany can't help who Tiffany is. That's who she is. Um, what I'm talking about, just like Cardi B, Cardi B is, is entertaining. Cardi B is talented. Cardi B is hardworking. Uh, but there are lots of um, entertaining people in Hollywood who are Black women like her. There are lots of talented people in Hollywood who are Black women like her. There are lots of hardworking people uh, in Hollywood who are, uh, you know, who have uh, all the skill sets that she has. So what you must ask yourself is why did they pick her out of everybody else? Why do they pick Tiffany Haddish? out of everybody else, right? It, you know, in fact, I would dare to say that if Tiffany Haddish suddenly became, you know, hyper-intelligent and pro-Black, you know, she started speaking on a weird Boyce Watkins kind of wavelength, I would be willing to bet you that white people would abandon her immediately. Uh, they would abandon her immediately. And so it, it's not really her fault. It's not, so, so when I make this uh, critique, it's not me pitting uh, us against Tiffany Haddish is really kind of us pitting ourselves against white supremacy to kind of say, you know, maybe there is another, maybe, maybe, you know, who knows, maybe there's another Tiffany Haddish inside of her. And I would be willing to bet you that she is afraid to release that Tiffany Haddish. Uh, in fact, when they've asked her qu important questions like, you know, about diversity in Hollywood, what do you think about the fact that there aren't enough, you know, there isn't enough diversity, there aren't enough, enough people of color, or isn't enough, you know, aren't enough women, whatever. She really just kind of blew over the question. I did not see her dig in and kind of say, well, yeah, this is, you know, this is something we have to address because it's a real issue. Um, I see her as a person that says, I've been busting my ass as a comic on the Chitlin circuit, trying to get ahead, trying to make a couple of dollars. Now this is my big break. I'm not going to mess it up. You know, and Negroes like Boyce Watkins, they fucking it up for me. Right. And, uh, and it, it, so it puts me in a precarious position. I feel very, very bad to have to tell the truth on this. But the, the, the problem is at the end of the day, uh, what a Tiffany Haddish or Kevin Hart or anybody kind of has to understand is that your success can't be more important than the success of the entire community. You know, uh, you know, but at the same time, you can't, you have to turn to the community and say, what are we supporting? You know, what are we looking for? What are we laughing at? You know, what are we doing to develop alternatives? You know, what are, are we developing the black Hollywood that we promised? I, I believe that we can build a black Hollywood space that allows for a more diverse representation of who we are as people. Um, you know, we try to do that. You know, we have Boyce Watkins films and we make movies. They're not big blockbusters like the stuff in Hollywood, but they're very good, you know? Um, and uh, and so I think that, you know, but you know, at the end of the day, when you look at all the people out here, you know, you got the the Rick Mathis's and the Tariq Nasheed's and the, uh, you know, the, uh, all the, the Byron Hurts and all the individuals that are making great films, great black movies for black people that work for our community. Maybe we should support that. In fact, there's the brother who made that movie. Uh, if you want to see a good movie, go see, wa watch the movie Black Coffee. Black Coffee. Um, and the brother, the director's name. Oh my goodness, I should have, I should have had his name in front of me. I want to say it's, I want to say it's Mark Muhammad, but I know it's wrong. That's that's wrong. That's not his actual name. But anyway, Black Coffee. If somebody knows the name, please tell me because I'm embarrassed. I don't remember his name. I'm just bad with names. But anyway, the the movie Black Coffee is extraordinarily good, you know, and, and I, I heard how great this movie was, and I said, let's watch this movie, and I watched it, and I watched it, and I said, these actors are saying a lot of things that sound like stuff I would see on my YouTube page, on my, on my Facebook page. I said, who's the director? Who made this movie? And it turns out the director literally lived three blocks away from me in Chicago. I couldn't believe it, um, and, uh, and, we, and we become friends, and that's why I'm embarrassed that I don't have his name in front of me, but I think that we have to support a more diverse array of black filmmakers so that we can get uh, a diverse array of black images. Um, you know, because remember, when you talk about Tiffany Haddish, you know, you're not really, you, you don't, you're really kind of talking about a situation where black people, you got to understand the different, Mark Harris, thank you, Duel, it's Mark Harris. I said Mark Muhammad, and that's stupid of me, but Mark Harris, Mark Harris, Mark Harris, Black Coffee, that's the name of the movie. He's got some other good stuff, too, that's really good. I don't have it all in front of me, but this is brother's bad. Love his movie. Love his stuff. Um, but, you know, with the Tiffany Haddish, what you got to just kind of understand is that um, you need to know the difference between when white people are laughing with you versus when they're laughing at you. 
when Tiffany Haddish is up there, you know, like, ha, and, and dancing, doing coochie dances because a white man walked in the building, like, white folks are not, you know, they're, like, they're, they're laughing at you because you're portraying the minstrel show that they, that they love to see. They're like, oh, my God, that Negro is so funny. You know, um, if you're on Instagram, I'm going to bring you guys right back. Uh, it's going to go away, but I'm bring you right back. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, okay, wait, you need to understand, like, like these people are, you know, these, these people would be laughing at you 200 years ago. Like, you would have been funny on the plantation. Like, on the plantation, you literally would have been right there in Massa's barn, you know, like, he would have been like, hey, you know, just have sex with me, and, and, and I'll keep giving you money, and, and you're so funny, you make me laugh, and you tickle my balls, like, like you're great, and, and that's the thing, so when you're, you're up there, and you're going on Ellen DeGeneres, talking about how much you'd love to sleep with all these white men, you know, that's really a perfect fit for uh, a plantation mentality, uh, you know, so, uh, so when you talk about, uh, you know, all of this, and I, I respond a little bit to some of the tweets, um, you know, that, that people made. Uh, my Twitter is Dr. Boyce Watkins one. That's where the conversation is happening. Dr. Boyce Watkins and then the number one at the end. Um, you, and you can jump into the conversation if you if you have something to say. I responded to some of the tweets, but truth be told, um, I didn't resp- I couldn't respond to everything because it was too many of them, number one. And then number two, you don't have to respond to everything in a conversation like this. You know, I made my point. Um, the point was heard. Uh, Tiffany and her supporters, and, or, and I'm a supporter of Tiffany to a point, uh, you know, they, they make their point, uh, and that point is heard. And I think at the end of the day, we have to have debates about these things. We, not suppression of ideas. I don't, want, I don't want people, I don't want Tiffany Haddish to be suppressed where she can't be herself. I just want us to ask ourselves, you know, what is it about our community that makes us gravitate toward imagery that is degrading and insulting and humiliating? You know, what is it that makes us think that, that she's keeping it real by keeping it raunchy? Like, like, why can't a woman be keeping it real when she's doing like what Vicki Dillard does? Vicki Dillard, uh, she does not curse when she does her podcast on Fly Newbie and Queen TV. Uh, Vicki Dillard does not um, portray herself in a way that is less than dignified. You know, Vicki Dillard does not degrade her community. Vicki Dillard does not get on uh, onto uh, her show and talk about how much she would love to go get in the elevator and do the Uchi Kuchi with a white man. She would never do that. She'd probably rather be dead than to do any of those things. Um, so why can't that be the same as keeping it real? Why, why, why can't, you know, keeping it real mean keeping it intelligent for a black woman? Why can't keeping it real mean, you know, keeping it productive for your community? Why can't keeping it real mean keeping it righteous, you know, or whatever it is, right? Like, why is it, why is keeping it real, you know, for us, for many of us, always so consistent with keeping it raunchy? That's what I'm saying. Like, why is why were so many people excited when Tiffany in Girls Trip was showing them how to suck a penis? There are millions of women who know how to suck a penis. Millions of women who know how to go on YouTube and find, you know, some porn star who can show you how to do whatever you want to do with that man's penis. And that's fine. Do what you want to do with your man. That's up to you. Why is it that we were so excited about the fact that this is the image of the black woman that's being portrayed throughout the entire world? That 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 is something that's a mental illness. I think you have to explore. Um, I think it's something that you, that re- requires us to look at ourselves in a in a in a, in a tough way. Um, it, it also goes into the space that black people don't like to go. Black people don't like we don't like critical self reflection that much. We kind of like to see ourselves as a bunch of little a bunch of disabled children who uh, who should take no responsibility for our actions and our behaviors and how we view ourselves. You know, we, we literally are a group of people, unfortunately, who've been trained uh, by the BETs of the world, et cetera, to believe that money matters more than anything, that if a celebrity is making money, then that defines them as successful. You are a successful black person if you're making lots of money. It does not matter how you made that money. It does not matter if you're a mumble rapper who's gone throughout the world promoting violence, drug addiction, and financial irresponsibility and sexual irresponsibility to young men all throughout the planet. It does not matter. If, if a white person paid you money, if your oppressor gave you a dollar, then you're considered a role model of success for the black community. Do you understand how dangerous that is? Do you understand how sick that is? 
I mean, really, again, intelligent black people will get this. Intelligent black people will get this. Some black people just won't, you know, and I don't know what to say to people who don't understand where I'm coming from. You might not agree. You might not agree. You ain't got to even agree. You might even tell me I'm crazy for half of what I say. But you can't say I don't have a point. You cannot say I don't have a point. And you also cannot disconnect the images you support in media from the oppression that you receive every day. They treat you like a hoe because you act like a hoe. You're advertising yourself as a hoe, so they're going to they're gonna look at you like a hoe. If you presented yourself as a clown, then why would you not think that they're going to look at you and say, oh, yeah, you're the clown I saw on TV the other day. Didn't we agree last week that you are a clown and a hoe? Why are you trying to act like a king and a queen and an intelligent person? Because that's not who you are. You, you people are the, are the clowns. You people are not the leaders. You're the followers. We're the leaders. We're white. Right? Like, why would you advertise yourself as something and then be surprised when people respond to you in the way that you've been advertised? So you got to think this through, people. Think this through, black people. If you don't think it through, then you'll always be confused. The reason white supremacy does so well in America is because black people love to fund it. We love to support it. We love to back it. We are addicted to it. We push it. We, we love to propel it. We are some of the greatest benefactors of the white supremacist infrastructure that there are. Just look at Black Friday right now and how many billions, billions of black dollars right now are going into the hands of the very same white people you complain about. How do you think you can stop an oppressor when you're funding the oppressor's actions against you? How do you think you can stop somebody from harming you when you're handing them the tools to attack you with? How do you think that you're going to slow down white supremacist institutions when you're funneling billions of dollars into those very same institutions? It doesn't compute. It does not work. It will literally make your head explode, actually, because you find that you, as a black person, have been put into a matrix with the kind of recursive loop that literally drive, will drive you insane, that literally will create unsolvable problems that you just are looking at and saying, oh my God, what is going on? I'm a hamster on a wheel. I thought I'm moving forward, but really I'm running in the same place and even going backwards. But I'm putting out lots of energy because I got lots of emotional energy. I'm getting mad every time a white person attacks me. But then again, I realize, wait a minute, I, I'm supporting him and his attack against me. I'm actually cheering for this. I'm cheering for my own genocide. When they play a genocidal song and put it to a good beat, I'm the first one on the dance floor. Oh my God, what am I going to do? This is driving me crazy. So what do you do? Instead, you just ignore it. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough thing to confront. Some people can deal with it. Some people can't. You know, and everybody else just says, you know, pass the liquor, nigga. Like that's, that's literally how a lot of our community deals with this. Because this, when I started to understand all of this, even I was like, my God, what have we gotten ourselves into? What are we fighting against? I'm done talking. Tiffany Haddish, if you're watching this, um, I do not hate you. Uh, I do not think, same thing with um, Kevin Hart. I do not hate you either. I know, I know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if I know people who know Kevin and stuff like that. And I, and I don't want him to think I hate him. I don't want Tiffany to think I hate them either. Um, you know, they have a right to be who they are. Uh, but, I, but I have a right to be who I am. And you have a right to be who you are. And uh, I just encourage you to take some time to kind of analyze some of this and, uh, and try to your best to, you know, enjoy life. If you watch a Tiffany Haddish movie and she makes you laugh, then laugh. You know, if you want to go see a movie that Tiffany's in, Go see the movie. You know, I'm not telling you not to do any of that. I'm just saying that, you know, we have to be thoughtful about the images that we allow them to use to portray who we are as people. You know, why they reward one thing and don't reward another, you know, and, and we got to call them out on this shit. But, but, even, but also at the end of the day, what's most important is you got to build your own. That's the, that's the number one solution for black people. At the end of the day, we must build our own. And, uh, and I believe we can do that. It's just going to take some time. So um, before I go, let me remind you, I'll be in Houston December 8th. If you want to come out, I'll be there with Dr. Venetia Dutra. She has a PhD in finance, brilliant black woman. This is the kind of black woman. These are the types of black women I roll with. I roll with the, the Dr. Venetia Dutras. I run with the attorney Tanya Nebos. I run with the attorney Nicole Compton's. I run with uh, the, the Vicki Dillards, the, you know, the Michi X's. Like the, those are the types of women that, 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 I, that I tend to you know, gravitate toward in terms of um, that, that sort of power. Uh, that's what that's what I look at as, as in terms of solutions for our people. 
Um, and, uh, and so we're going to be in Houston December 8th. If you want to know more, go to drboycehouston.com. It's drboycehouston.com. Uh, hit the thumbs up button if you're on YouTube. Please take a second and do that. Uh, also, if you want to get a text alert when I go live, text the word voice to 31996. Text voice to 31996. Um, and last but not least, uh, for Black Friday or this weekend, if you want to uh, enroll your children in the Black Business School in our, our new, brand new, spanking new entrepreneurship program for children, uh, you can go to blackceofactory.com. That's blackceofactory.com. We call it blackceofactory.com because we believe that in order to build the next generation, we, will, we must mass produce, almost like, um, uh, almost like planting just thousands and thousands of seeds to grow a massive harvest. We believe we should mass produce uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of black uh, business owners for the next generation. Young people who at the age of seven are being introduced to the concepts on how to start a business. Uh, and, uh, and and this is going to pay off for us in about 15 to 20 years. OK, so uh, if you want your child to be part of that, we, we are building that army. Uh, go to BlackCEOFactory.com. And uh, if you use the discount code Black Friday Kids, one word, Black Friday Kids, you can get 55% off the program, 55% off. Massive fit is it's a huge discount. And uh, so it won't cost you more than I think like 80 cents a day. I think that with the discount, it's literally 80 cents a day. And uh, in this program, what I do is I break down uh, everything your child will know to start their own business, uh, everything about operating agreements, LLCs versus uh, S corporations versus sole proprietorships, uh, how to market your business, how to sell your product, how to get the funding for your business, all of that. And on top of that, when your child is done with the material, they can get a, um, a certificate of completion, which they can put on their wall like a college degree so they can say that they are a graduate of the Black Business School, which uh, is the Black Harvard. That is the Black Harvard University. Our professors are second to none, best in the world, and it won't cost you more than 80 cents a day, which um, uh, if you can change your, your child's life for 80 cents a day, I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? So feel free to go check it out at blackceofactory.com. Use the discount code, one word, Black Friday Kids. Uh, this is the kind of gift that you can give your child now that will last them for the next 50 years. It's going to last more than any toy you buy for Christmas, any video game, any pair of sneakers, any of that. And yes, adults can join too, Brittany. Uh, so uh, we actually have a lot of adults that join our children's programs because the videos are animated and it takes complicated concepts and makes them very simple. So if you're an adult and you want to join, join too. Or if you have a child in Black CEO Factory, then uh, join with your child, like go through the stuff with your child so that you can create a culture in your family that leads to uh, economic opportunity in the next generation. So I love you guys. It was real. I'm out. So uh, take care and uh, thank you guys for uh, putting up with my crazy ass. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Peace.